Is my microphone on? I'm sorry? OK, that's better. Uh, <laughs> hello. Uh, this is a special treat for me. After years in San Francisco, I actually get to come back to the UK and talk to my fellow countrymen and women. People I actually understand after years at San Francisco. People who like Jaffa Cakes and Pizza Express. <laughs> People who have a profound love for and, you know, notable suspicion of the French. <laughs> People that understand that the right way to date people is to get very drunk somewhere in their presence and hope you wake up with them the following morning. <laughs> I mean, I understand you people much, much more than I understand Americans, and so this is quite a big deal for me. Um, but like any homecoming, it's also a bit intimidating, particularly intimidating now that uh, Tom Lusmore has raised the adrenaline in my body over thinking about the BBC again. Um, so I need you to make me feel particularly welcome. Are you ready to give me some love? I can't hear you. Are you ready to give me some love? That's what I like. Okay, brilliant. Hello, London! <laughs> okay, so this is, uh, this is me. I'm Tom Coates. Uh, this is a picture of me when I was thinner and had a better hat. I work primarily in new product development and invention. Uh, basically, what I try and do is look at the direction that technology is moving in, and then I try and spot the product possibilities in that movement. Uh, when I work, on the whole, I'm looking for things that make people's lives more interesting, productive, or fun, and which, you know, make some money for companies in the process. I used to work for companies like Time Out, Yahoo and the BBC, but now I have my own little company, Product Club, with my future business partner, Matt Bedolf. Uh, we exist as soldiers of fortune on the streets of San Francisco. If you have a problem, if no one else can help, and if you can find us... Anyway. Uh, now, while I'm on the subject, I understand that there's been some spam in the uh, Mind the Product uh, hashtag today, and I've heard that it's quite common for people to you know, offer up their own hashtag for people when they're giving talks so that people can write about them and say nice things about them. So I've come up with a hashtag for you today, uh, and... Um, if you, could, uh, <laughs> if you could use that, I'd really appreciate it. Thanks very much. Okay, let's get going. So for the last few years, I've been thinking and working and talking at conferences about the emerging web of data and about how when we connect things together, when we recombine things, then extraordinary new possibilities emerge. I'm interested in the way that data on the web connects together how sites and services spread outside the bounds of web pages and emerge in apps on iPads or iPhones or connect to other sites and services. I'm interested in how these individual connected components come together to be more than the sum of their parts, with information flowing between them freely, layering the world in a new network of cycling and recombinant data upon which we can build and which massively opens up the creative possibilities for all of us. I believe this new network that is emerging has as much potential to transform the world of information and the things we make as the transport and trading networks of the last few centuries have changed the way we build physical things. And in fact, if there was one thing I wanted you to take away from this talk today, it would be this, that the new product possibility space that's out there is basically all the technologies in the world plus all the data in the world squared. It's like, every, every, get two things that are interesting, put them together, and see what product possibilities fall out of them. There is a vast amount of creative work in that space. Today, though, I want to talk about a very specific interest of mine that I've been exploring for the last couple of years, the way that the network is starting to permeate the physical world, and how data, physical objects, and even our environments are starting to merge together. And in particular, I'm going to be talking about a, a little subset of that, connected appliances and devices in the home. I want you to think about the network, by which I mean access to the internet with all the streams of data and computation that could lie behind that simple connection, as an animating spark, a bit like electricity was before, pervading objects in our environment, bringing new functionality to them, new life to them, new intelligence to them. And I want you to consider what might be possible when all the computational and informational possibilities of the internet are available to every device in the home or, or on the street where the objects around you start manifesting a limited amount of intelligence and agency and how you'll think about that. But most importantly, I want you to consider the idea for the moment that this vision of the future that I'm selling you isn't a vision of the future at all. It's a vision of now, just on the cusp of moving from theory and science fiction into the normal fabric of our lives. And that 
The reason I'm telling you guys about it is because you are the guys that are quite likely to be among the people that are first to make that transition. That's why I'm here today in a room full of product people to think about what's next and to consider this brand new area. And yes, I'll be talking about internet fridges. <laughs> All right then, away from theory into the shops. So I have a theory. This is an unflattering theory. It's an uncharitable theory. It is that the way we think about the future betrays our present. My theory is that interaction designers, academics, and futurists, like on occasion myself, when exploring the more far out possibilities of new technologies, have one fundamental goal. And this goal is not to illustrate really practical things that you might want to bring into your home. When we do that kind of visionary exploratory work, we're normally attempting to persuade. We're attempting to demonstrate, first and foremost, why the technology that we're exploring could be, should be important in the future. And we're trying to show how world transformative it could be. Essentially, we massively oversell it. But this comes with costs. You might get some people very enthusiastic about the promise of the technologies you're talking about, but you're normally, in the short selling time at least, massively overselling. Uh, in your desire to impress, you build models of things that are extreme, fantastic, unusual, and weird. You desire, your desire fundamentally is to show how strange and exotic the future is likely to be. And it's an unfortunate fact of life that the, one of the reasons we do that is because when we're doing these demonstrations, the technology we're talking about is expensive and complicated. So the things that you have to make to demonstrate the value of this stuff are similarly grandiose and over the top. You have to make big concepts because you have to say it's a reasonable use of the resources involved. Um, so, you know, they're performance pieces, essentially. They're extraordinary. They're concept cars but they're not normally practical things that you bring into your home. This has not stopped us thinking or talking about them. And here are just some of the major labels used to talk about networked physical devices. Uh, and there's a lot of fascinating and interesting thinking in this space with talented and brilliant people building models and theories and prototypes for decades. And there's a lot of really great work here, but none of it, or almost none of it, has been getting inside people's homes. I'm here today to persuade you that we're on the cusp of a change in this area, that the network is starting more and more to pervade the everyday, that there are tangible and practical applications, and most importantly, that the people who will be doing this work, that will be taking it from the ivory tower and into the home is people like you. And basically, it all comes down to cost. When the cost of network functionality and computation when the hardware that gets you online and the costs of the network that are online are expensive, the possibilities of things you have to sell are huge. It's very difficult. They're just big, grandiose projects. But when it halves and halves again and keeps on halving, then we no longer need to think about this grand performance. We don't need concept videos full of perfect, shiny, rich families who use virtual reality and pervasive reactive glass to swim peacefully through an idyllic life of comfy taupe sweaters, picnics and little league games, working calmly and effortlessly on nearby panes of reactive glass while laughing at sunsets and hugging each other. <laughs> we don't need any of that crap. Instead, we can look to the everyday devices and appliances that surround us, surround real people every day, and we can think about what extra value we can create what problems we can solve if the extra hardware we need to bring a dishwasher or a fridge or a whatever uh, online costs five pounds or a pound or 50 pence or less. Again, it's my belief we're at that point now. This is one of my favorite slides ever because it's a live clock. Uh, there's no reason for it to be a live clock except it is a live clock. So you can all cheer now if you like. Um, <laughs> it was Matt Webb who introduced me to the history of the LCD clock. Uh, and pointed out some of the lessons that we could learn from it. When they were first created, LCDs were not cheap. Over time, however, there was massive demand for LCD clocks, and that meant that the, the, this demand drove new ways of manufacturing them and producing them, until gradually they were stamped out at a, you know, a penny a unit, and then they started to appear everywhere in video recorders, TV sets, cassette players, radio sets, car dashboards. They appeared in places where a clock wasn't strictly needed. In pretty much every place, a clock isn't strictly needed. 
um, and they added a tiny amount of incremental value. But that didn't matter because the cost of them was even less than that group of in that incremental value. And again, the same thing appears to be happening with network technologies right now. What once was expensive is now bordering on trivial. Here's an example. Does anyone know what this is? Any hands? A few of you. It's a Raspberry Pi, right? Uh, it's, a, it's a board that you can buy as a technological, technical enthusiast. You can buy for 25 pounds. And it is entirely, it's a complete Linux computer. Uh, this, by the way, the, the, the pane here is about the size of an iPhone. And the processor is that. That's the actual computer. Most of the rest of this stuff is just plugs. This thing can run 1080p full HD video on any TV in the world. Uh, and this is $25 for um, a hobbyist. If you bought this in bulk, if you buy this functionality in bulk, obviously the costs just drop and keep dropping. This is the kind of thing we, we can work with now, like complete computers at you know, dollar prices or less. And this is the Kindle. Now, if I'd said to you a few years ago, imagine a device that costs about 100 pounds, and it comes with always on perpetual, worldwide, free 3G wireless connection to the internet, you'd have laughed at me. Uh, and now it's Amazon's best-selling product, although I think they've changed some of the terms, so it's less accurate. But um, accepting for a moment that the network requirements of, of the Kindle are pretty low, and that Kindles are pretty much subsidized, it still remains a piece of hardware that you can buy for 100 bucks and which includes lifetime and potentially worldwide network access. This is enormous. This is a huge change. And it's reasonable from this to think of all the other things that cost 100 pounds or 100 dollars or less that could also have network functionality in them. Like, like anything at that price point now, it's actually sensible. It's rational to start thinking, what could this do if it had the network in it? So there are two concepts that I think have narrowed down my perspective on you know, this massive world of potential network-enabled hardware. Uh, and I think they most accurately describe what I'm getting at and what I can think constitutes a significant transition in our understanding of network devices. And they are mundane computing and MujiComp. Neither of these are particularly mainstream. Um, uh, they come from you know, inspirational thinkers around the place, fun people I know and I think are really cool. And uh, they deserve to be taken seriously, I think. This is mundane computing. This is Chris Heathcote, who is the person who came up with the phrase mundane computing. Uh, and this is Chris on a train. Uh, he threw out this concept in a blog post uh, as an off-the-cuff comment, but it's stuck with me ever since. He gave some context before he explained his specific problem. And this is it. A lot of time and effort is spent on the extremes of life, going to new places, finding new things and people. But most of life isn't like that. Most of the time, people are in routines, doing the same thing day after day. It's not a bad thing, it's life. And I'm interested in how technology can help make some of those daily moments better. Now, there's nothing here that anyone here is going to disagree with, right? In practice, though, um, in practice, we might consider this a fairly obvious sentiment. But somehow, in the world of network-enabled physical devices, this seems kind of revolutionary. So let's, let's, not start, let's stop thinking about, like, you know, uh, fridges with RFID chips and scanners inside them that order your food off, off the internet, you know, but actually think about the, the boring, simple, trivial challenges we're all stuck with. What he's saying is give up on your Ubicomp. Stop being so bloody high concept. Do something useful. Here's Chris's problem. It's a very simple one. I'm hoping that some of you can identify with it. It's the device that beeps. He has a washing machine, and when it finishes washing, it beeps endlessly. And then it beeps again, and then it beeps again. For an hour, it keeps on beeping. It cries out into the abyss. Why don't you love me? <laughs> and Chris is in another part of his house thinking to himself, well, I don't want to get up right now. I want to sit here and play Minecraft, or read Don Quixote, or eat a pork pie. Um, all things I imagine English people do. Um, I get the point, you're done, but I didn't really need to know that right now. Another example, my mother has a drying, uh, clothes dryer. It does the same thing. 
I dried your damn clothes for you, but don't for one second think I'm happy about it. Just like, it beeps again and again, and it will not shut up. In my own life, I went out and bought myself a scuba, which is uh, like a rumba, only it washes floors. This is my house. Uh, um, I did it because scubas are cool and brilliant and awesome, and 99% of the time my scuba is brilliant and happy, and then every so often it gets caught on some wires and while it's cleaning, and it starts beeping. And this incredibly disappointed voice comes across and shouts across the house, Scuba is stuck. Please move Scuba to a new location and press start to restart. <laughs> and he wants me to do it that precise moment. And if I don't, it'll keep beeping and moaning. <laughs> Chris and I agree that these are needy products. They need to take a stress pill, calm the fuck down. And we can't help but think that this functionality of a device shouting into the abyss is something very simple that could be fixed and solved very easily with basic cheap network functionality. Now, Chris's proposed solution is this basically tiny little app that sits on his laptop or mobile phone, which he can use to check the status of um, the device at a distance, and with which he can tell it to shut the hell up. And at one level, that's really all I'm talking about. That's really all mundane computing, as Chris thinks about it, is about. It's looking at the possibilities of making the devices in our home more effective in very simple, cheap ways, because the network access itself is now very simple and very cheap. I'll talk more about this kind of area in a bit. Now, another concept that I like comes from Matt Jones and Jack Schultz of the London company Berg, who are responsible for, among other things, the amazing Little printer. Hello. Uh, how many people here have heard of little printer? So like two thirds of you. It's a small printer. Um, uh, how many people here have bought it? Well, then you'll all be delighted to hear that it's available for pre-order now at bergcloud.com. You've all got mobile devices, get to it. Anyway, Matt's concept is MujiComp. Um, I'm assuming you all know what Muji is, um, but for the microscopic number of you who may not, it's a Japanese company that sells, essentially, stripped down, simple, elegant, unbranded bits of homeware and furniture. They're not particularly expensive, and they are very nice. Matt's point when he was talking about Muji Comp was primarily about the aesthetics of the company and his desire to translate that to network-enabled devices. So they stopped being this kind of mess of cables and nerdisms and started being beautiful objects. He describes it as sexy and desirable Ubicomp, able to be appreciated as cultural design objects rather than as technology. Tasteful, simple, clear, clean, contemporary, and affordable, able to be invited into the home. I think this is an incredibly noble goal but for me, that, that quote skips over some of the other aspects of things that are brought from shops like Muji. It's not just that they're beautiful and simple. It's not just that they're able to be invited into the home. It's that they are useful. They're normal. They're practical. And they're stylish. They're stylish, things of, stylish versions of things that already exist in the world. Housewares, furniture, technology. Beautiful and well-designed, sure, but also mundane, practical, normal, of the world. You may be starting to get the sense that I'm quite cross with uh, futurists. This is actually not true. Um, uh, the people who do this kind of exploratory work is, is a brilliant and, and valuable people. Um, but, you know, again, I think we're at this transition point where some people with knowledge of what works for humans and knowledge of business and knowledge of what sells and how to make good user interfaces can take some of the best simple ideas and translate them into the marketplace. But before I talk about the best simple ideas and how to translate them to the marketplace, let's just get the bugbears right out there on the table and mock the crap out of them. Does my fridge need Twitter? Right, let's start with the recommendation. There is an amazing Tumblr blog, which some of you may know, called Fuck Yeah Internet Fridge. Um, I would never normally swear, I hope you understand, but it's the name of the blog. Uh, it's been assembled by Rue Reynolds, it's spectacular, and you should all go and look at it as soon as this talk is over. This is an appliance that exists in the world now. Uh, there are many of these appliances that exist in the world now, actual devices with network access in them. They're sold by companies like Samsung, LG, Panasonic, General Electric, loads of them. And frankly, if their interest at this moment doesn't make you think that 
the price points for these kind of components are so low now that you know there is potential for them to be introduced into many such home appliances, then you're kind of nuts. Um, this fridge has, well, I mean, the big problem with all this stuff, though, is they're doing all this work, but it's all crap. So, I mean, that's a big problem. Right? This fridge has skeuomorphic replicas of things that you could just do with pen or paper, pen or paper, or post-its and magnets, but it also has its own Twitter client. It also has a way of browsing the news. It has Pandora, so you can listen to music. Now, I don't mean to sound weird, but what person out there goes and buys a really expensive fridge with all this stuff on it and doesn't own an iPad or a phone or something like that one? Who goes, I've got an iPad, but I'd rather listen to music on my fridge? <laughs> the message seems to be need to be stated and restated. Having something attached to the internet does not mean it has to have a browser. It doesn't mean it has to have a screen attached to it at all, in fact, for a whole range of reasons, including the fact that normally the screens are the most, most expensive part. If there's one thing that holds back network-enabled network devices, in my opinion, it's the desire to stick bloody screens on them all. And this is what I mean about price and performance. If something costs a lot, then you have to advertise its benefits a lot. You have to make a performance of the internet. Uh, internetness. You know, this has to scream internetness, and internetness is browsers and screens. But as the price drops, you can start thinking about how to make the thing actually more useful. And you don't have to make such a big song and dance about the whole thing. You don't have to sell it on the basis of the screen. Again, it doesn't matter if the benefit is minor as long as the cost is less. Here's another reason why that fridge makes no sense. Now, uh, Hands up if you think that most fridges are replaced in under five years. I'm just walking into things over here. No one. Okay. Hands up if you think most fridges are replaced in under 10 years. Ooh, quite a lot of you, about half. How many people think under 15 years? Okay, right. Actually, most fridges are replaced over 15 years. More than 15 years to replace a fridge. Now, not being weird, here's a computer from 15 years ago. <laughs> If we'd done ubiquitous computing 15 years ago, you'd have that stapled to the front of your dishwasher. <laughs> this is dumb. My point here is about upgrade cycles. That um, there are objects and things in the home that will be updated very rapidly and replaced very rapidly. And there are other things in the home that get replaced on a much slower time scale. And if you're going to build network-enabled fun functionality into those devices, you have to try and match the, uh, the, the likely upgrade cycle of the technology with the likely upgrade subject cycle of the thing. So this brings me to my other, my favorite other spectacle. Now, Corning are a company that are UK-based, so does anyone work for them? Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> this is the dumbest piece of crap I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> it's a future in which pretty much every single surface in the home is covered with display and touchscreen technology, from the bathroom mirror to the kitchen counter. But let's be serious for a moment. How often do people replace their kitchens? I am now 40, much to my horror. I have never done this. I've always gone into places, and there's always been pre-existing stuff. Uh, until such a point that the stuff they show off here is vanishingly cheap, so that it's as much as like just popping off a surface and sticking another one in, it's just not going to happen. I mean, you might see that. I mean, it's not going to happen. <laughs> Just turn around and there's another one. Anyway, we may see this kind of functionality in places with massive footfall and loads of human beings walking past them, public places where you, know, you can get a piece of technology and replace it every year or so, um, you know, and that works. But in the home, it's balls. Here is, um, this is a classic. This is Stuart Brand's uh, description of the shearing layers of a house, which I think is really interesting generally and particularly useful in this case. So he, he talks about the, the six S's, you know, and so there's the site at the bottom and then the structure. The skin is like the, the, the stuff on the outside of the house, like the paint job and all that kind of stuff. Inside it, you have the space plan, which I think he means to also, the services and space plan, includes things like electricity and water supply, but also I think the big appliances and the large inbuilt pieces of furniture like cupboards and stuff. And then in the middle is stuff, right? And I'm pretty sure he thinks of human beings in that category, you know? <laughs> Uh, um, uh, so, 
the important thing from, my, from his perspective is that he talks about these as each coming at a diff, having a different rate of change. Right? The site basically stays the same, unless you live in San Francisco, in which case you're always a bit nervous about that. <laughs> the structure will last between 30 and 300 years. The space plan, uh, the services, 7 to 15. The space plan, 30 to 30, 3 to 30. Uh, the skin, maybe up to 20 years if you're lucky. The stuff inside, anything from a day to a month, right? If you want to build something that people are going to bring into their homes full of technology that isn't going to just feel completely out of date immediately, they're not going to build it into the structure of their homes. They're just not. They're not even going to build it in the space plan. It doesn't make sense. Right. So that's some stuff that is bunk, right? Here's a few things that, here's what I think, it's some angles on what could work. And it's very much less overstated. It's very much less performative, right? Uh, um, but I think the simplest interventions in this space build into something much better and much larger down the line. I keep walking into this damn thing. Um, uh, and I'll, I'll talk a bit more about that later. But this is Matt Rowlandson. He's one of my favorite people. He heads up the UX and strategy, strategy team at a product and service design company called Ammunition in San Francisco. He was one of my favorite people because he works in this area, and yet he's not nuts. <laughs> the Ammunition Group, if you're interested, they worked on the Nook ebook reader for Barnes & Noble. They worked on Beats by Dr. Dre, because you just look at him, he's just completely street. Um, <laughs> uh, among loads of other work for like HP, Microsoft, Nike, Panasonic. They, they, no, they're, they're really cool. Like, look at their site if you can. And he has this principle, which he's been using, because clients are coming to him now and saying, you know, we want this physical appliance to have an iPad app. You know? And he's going like, oh, actually, there is value. There's potential in this space. And this is happening a lot, by the way, right now. Um, but he's got this principle, and it's so obvious, or it seems so obvious, but if you looked at all the stuff we saw earlier, the, the fridge and all that crap, you know, I mean, it's, it's not obvious, apparently, to the design departments of major um, appliance manufacturers. It's so simple, I'm determined to push it to a wider audience, and it is this. Basically, you should use the network to amplify a tool's core purpose, not to make another bloody web browser or Twitter client. Let me give you a quick example, and this is an example I've used before, so if you've seen me talk before. How many people have seen me talk before? Too many of you. Shit. Uh, you'll have seen this before, anyway. So I love this. This is a uh, Withings scale. It's a bathroom scale. It's one of my favorite network-enabled devices in the world. Um, I weigh myself regularly on it, and then I ignore what the sum's on the screen, and I go and get a can of Coke and a chocolate bar and sit down and watch some TV. Um, uh, unfortunately, it's incapable of fixing my total lack of motivation to get thinner and do exercise. But nonetheless, apart from that, it's a perfect example of what you can do with sort of mundane technology. Useful, practical, network-enabled devices. So my main goal in having some bathroom scales is that I have a better grasp of my weight over time. But normal bathroom scales can't do that. If you want to understand how your weight actually shifts and changes and track it, then you have to stick up a bloody graph in your, on your wall in your bathroom so that your neighbors can come in and go, hmm. Uh, <laughs> it's non-optimal. You know, or, like, or if you're single, like you bring someone home, you're like, hey, come up to, and they're like, what the fuck? Um, <laughs> I can go on the web, and I can see my status over time. This actually was my status over time, but about a year and a half ago. If you can imagine this completely reversed, <laughs> that's what's been happening more recently. So this data is up on the cloud. It's up, up there in the internet. And if I don't like their website, there are devices made by other people. There's apps, there's called an app called WeightBot, um, which I can just access, and it'll show me all the data and the information I need to know. It's a bit washed out here, I'm afraid. Um, and if I want to find a way of correlating my weight with my activity on my amazing new Nike fuel band, it's the future, um, then uh, I can. More importantly, if I want to, I can splurge it up on Twitter so that everyone in the world can, can see how ridiculously fat I am and so that they can shame me into doing more exercise. I say that as if it actually happened, but... <laughs> uh, and more interestingly then, you know, you can do a search, simple keyword search on Twitter to see how fat everyone on the planet is, you know. <laughs> uh, uh, I actually ha I used to have this uh, up at a, at, a, at a Twitter account called How Fat Is Tom, right? Um, 
But I took that down and I've replaced it, and I'll, sh I'll show you why in a minute, because I've, I've got something better now, which could give you unprecedented access into the really tedious minutiae of my life. Right, anyway. Now, the reason I talk about the Withing Scale is not because, not just because in and of itself it's a beautiful object, although it is. Um, I refer to it because it epitomizes what I consider to be the fundamental principles of intelligent networked product decisions. And I'm going to start by running through a few of them. None of you mind if I overrun by 10 minutes, right? Say yes if you mind. Excellent. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to do that more often in conferences. <laughs> That's, uh, you, know, you get one person. Going, right, so the first, first principle, it's really simple to get it onto the network in the first place. Right? That is, goes without saying, don't need to talk about that much more. Although, not wanting to talk about it much more, I can talk about it a bit. It's still too complicated in some ways, and there's no reason, like the way we saw with the Kindle, like, you know, stamp out SIM cards, stick in an aerial, uh, for, a, for a less than a dollar, you could have something in every um, uh, appliance in your home that would just comes with a, a personalized code. As soon as you get it out of the box and plug it in, it's already online. All you have to do is type the code into a website, and bang, you're connected. Totally reasonable, totally practical, would make it even easier. Secondly, and I think this may be transitional, but it still works when the device is not online. You know, my scales still work. I can still weigh myself. I just can't get the benefit of the wider services. And, you know, and I think that's actually a reasonable thing because no one wants to be in a situation where your, you know, your, your network goes down and you can't get any milk out of the fridge. You know, this is <laughs> just impractical. No! Uh, it's impractical. This is one, I think, one of the ones I think is the most important. That the bulk of the intelligence is not in the device, but it's in the cloud. It's on the internet. And this gets me back to that shearing layers thing. You know, uh, If you can upgrade the intelligence of every device in your house because the service is elsewhere and that can be upgraded, then there's less of an issue about you know, the technology moving at a different pace to the environment. Um, so what, what actually is in the device? I mean, what I mean here is the device is hard to upgrade, but the internet is very easy to upgrade if you own the thing. So you know, put, the, put the stuff that needs to get upgraded in the cloud. But what do you leave in the device? Personally, I think it, it's really easy. You put in the bit that connects to the network, sensors that tell you the status of the device and any information about that thing, and ideally some actuators, things that will actually mean I can control some of the functions. That's it. There's very little need for anything more. Everything else can be built online by people like us, right? People with a history of product management and, and building and design in web and web service industries. This follows on from the previous one. Don't need to put a damn display in everything. And the, uh, the scales don't have one because we're already surrounded by displays. Most of us carry displays with us every day. Um, you don't, what does the interface for a networked fridge or dishwasher look like? Is it embedded in your kitchen counter? No, of course not. It's one of these. They exist now. You don't need to go any further. The future is, in my opinion, not a world covered in you know, super amazing touch, touch services but a few multi-purpose screens that give you access to the premium, the more complicated features of um, any object around you. Simple cut-down interface on the object and a much larger, more powerful, simpler uh, interface on one of your existing screens, whether it be web, phone, iPad, whatever. And this is, like I think, the most important part. Why are you doing it in the first place? That the way you can enhance the object is by making it easier to control or to understand how it works and what it's doing. This is why we want network connectivity in our objects. Um, and in the medium term, it's not just us that might be doing some of this stuff. Like the data that you get, imagine a scenario where, oh, actually, I'll get to that in a minute. These are, these are um, a few things that I think every single bloody object in the world should be able to give me out, um, uh, programmatically. I should be able to ask any device, where are you? Who do you belong to? What are you doing? What, are you, what did you do? What have you been doing? How much power are you using? And how well are you functioning? And when I talk about like historically, I mean like, show me an error log, show me the problems, show me all the failings, all the flaws. And I should be able to, ask, to tell the machine that I want to control some of the basic functions from a distance. I want to receive an alert when something goes wrong, and I want to receive alerts when jobs are completed. Now just thinking about something like, you know, I have a washing machine outside my, you know, a shared washing machine with my apartment. Um, uh, often it stops, it goes like, oh no, there's too much stuff in here, I'm gonna stop. 
And then I go out there going, yeah, I'll just put this in the dryer. And it's just, I have to turn it on again and let's go through the whole thing. Like, a simple notification that something had gone wrong saved me no end of trouble. And would it have to be bloody beeping? <laughs> no. Now, interestingly, for a car, you can get most of this stuff already, right? Uh, um, cars have little sockets, which um, when you take them into companies, they plug the thing in and they can get algorithmic information, interesting information about how the car's been functioning. And they use that to build a service log. So there's, there's potential here for a service log for every single object in the world. Here is a way in which you could just view and understand your own data. But at the other end of the spectrum, there's what the manufacturer could get out of it. We're all used to the idea that you stick out, um, details and information and tracking things inside web pages to get a sense of what's working. But there's no way currently that an appliance manufacturer can do the same thing until now. Now they can say, actually, this washing machine is used in this way by this people this often. It has these kind of problems. It fails in these ways over certain periods of time. You could build services around that saying, when this bit goes down, send them a notification. Tell them this thing is going to go wrong. Would you like us to kind of schedule a visit and come and fix the damn thing? These are really useful, practical, slightly boring, but totally real things you could do right now with a little bit of network connection. And then there's the control. I have this thing set up with my lights at my house. I can like pull out my phone right here, I press a button, and my lights in my sitting room in uh, San Francisco go on. That in itself is not too super interesting. Build a service around it so that I can um, say I'm here at this point of this. Uh, I'm away for a couple of weeks set it on the, the program to show the burglars that I'm here, you know, that would be fine. Uh, this is, these are, I call these shims. They're things that kind of sit between the existing infrastructure and the network. I've taken this a bit further, obviously. If you want to go and see House of Coats on Twitter, and this is, my, this is what I can imagine my house's face looks like, um, uh, you can see all the notifications of things that are going on in my house as I move around. There's a couple of motion sensors, a few other things around the place. It's quite fun. It can even change the way we think about ownership. This goes back a bit to some of the stuff Bruce Sterling said a few years ago, um, that if you stick um, location and ownership information on every object, what does it mean for theft to occur? You know, you've stolen something, I know where it is. You know, it reports who it belongs to. What fun? It's easy. Um, but also shared ownership. Places with, like, Amazon lockers for storing uh, a, a, a community's equipment that can be checked out and checked in again automatically. Or people giving you an appliance and charging you by the time you use it, all based on the ability to track information. This stuff has been done for years in industry. And there's a thing called GE's talking about called the industrial internet in this space. It's called telematics and telemetry. It's kind of fascinating. Last thing I want to talk about. Uh, impolite devices, going right back to the beginning. Uh, this is my scuba, which beeps too much, even though I love him. Uh, what would it be like if I could stick him on the network? What, what could I get out of that? Firstly, I could get status. How's he doing at any given point? I could personalize him. I could say, I want more, he wants more exercise. He's got loads of energy. He's a bit thirsty. That's quite nice. <laughs> when something went wrong or was going really well, he could tweet at me rather than beeping. He can actually communicate with me in the channels I understand. I finished cleaning. Happy scuba. He's stuck. Sad scuba. He's grumpy. I, there's, ITP have done loads of interesting work on this stuff. Um, botanicals is a really good way of like instrumenting your plants in your house so that they will tweet at you when, when they need water. It's quite fun. Um, this is another one from a pe similar period. Courtney loves medicine cabinet. Uh, this is not a product you can buy, and warning, it's not really Courtney Loves. But um, basically what it does, it's a, it's a, it's a, um, it's a cabinet that's also on IRC. Uh, it records whenever she takes any pills out of it, or when someone takes pills out of it. And then when she, if she goes on IRC, when she's like, hi, it goes, it goes. <laughs> <laughs> it's that easy, right? Um, fun, but easy. It's an ITP project from years ago. Uh, and once you've started getting things online, then you can do social things with them. You can get like basic fun information and use it. So choose a color. Which is your favorite? Uh, I'm going to ask you to shout because we're going to have a race. Live scuba racing live on stage. I, how many of you can say you've done that this week? <laughs> Are you ready? I want you to shout the name, which is the color, of the thing as we go. Right? Ready? Say yes, Tom. Yes, Tom. There we go. Ready? Oh!
<laughs> so one last thing about this, you know, I, I've stuck a lot of faces on these things, and I think it's kind of interesting. Um, there's another debate going on at the moment about like whether these devices get some kind of, you know, when you can't intuit their motives because they're responding to things around the place, you know, like uh, how how do you start interacting with them? Do you need them to be kind of personalised? And I think there's you know quite a lot of interest in that. Oh, what's going on here? Yeah, I've been thinking a little bit about like how you might kind of make an environment where. Um, uh, like a, a home chat room where your devices talk to one another while you're, a, while you're away uh, in human readable English so you can kind of pop in at any point, you know, find out what's going on. I think that's quite fun. But nonetheless, you know, here's the big alarm. Do we really want to live in a world like this? No, 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 no. Freshly pressed with dessert, she'll want tea, and my dear, that's fine with me. While the cups do their soft chewing, I'll be bubbling, I'll be brewing, I'll get. Do we want to live in a world like that? Yes! <laughs> no, maybe not. Okay, here we are at the end of my talk, and I'm sure a few of you are breathing a sigh of relief, particularly those of you who are worried about time. Um, my goal today was to try and convince you that there is traction and considerable future in the fusion of the physical and digital in the home. And that it's not all just a punchline for a joke about technological excess, any more than it's about performative interaction design experiments. I wanted to try and get you guys to step up and start seriously thinking about how you could get involved, how you could take this stuff out of labs and bring it into the world, or how you could work with companies that are doing hardware and make an experience that's actually web native. I've been talking primarily about devices that you have in the home, um, but the stuff I've talked about here is at best a tiny fraction of what you could make in the future. I've not talked about the amazing stuff that people are building out in civic structures like public architecture and you know, street furniture. Uh, and, uh, and the brand new categories of projects that could emerge, you know, it's too difficult to predict them, honestly, right now. So I, I decided not to go into too much detail on those things. But to have any chance of building those things, we're going to need to discuss and talk and uni unite groups of people who don't normally talk to each other. This is, um, it comes back to me to one of the big statements by Raymond Lowy, uh, who is uh, one of the most, well, actually he's known as one of the high priests of industrial design, or in fact he called himself the father of industrial design, and I'm pretty sure he's Tony Stark's dad. <laughs> uh, he used this acronym, uh, which is Maya, M -A -Y -A. Uh, and this stood for most advanced yet acceptable. It's what he thought the goal of all industrial designers should be, a goal that I now think extends to all of us involved in the making of new things. It falls in two parts. Firstly, most advanced, he believed it was our responsibility as creators to always be pushing the extreme possibilities of what it was possible to conceive of or to make. He believed that was true in a financial capacity, it was good business, and a moral capacity. This is what we're here for. I believe merging the physical with the digital is that frontier at the moment. It's fascinating, exciting, and it will happen. But he also said, acceptable. He believes we have a second responsibility, to bring the general public with us into the future, to make amazing things that aren't alienating, terrifying, but are useful, fun, creative, and non-threatening. I'm here today to tell you that the future is part of our work, the bits where you might talk about what technology might afford us, might do. Ubicomps, pervasive computing, everywhere, spines. That's all over. The future isn't network-enabled products, it's just products. And it's not even the future, it's now. And we are the people with the responsibility to push those products into the world. None of this we'll be able to do alone. It will need us as product people to collaborate with technologists, futurists, digital designers, industrial designers, and businessmen. So here's my call to action. Get out there and start having those conversations, because one of those conversations may be the animating spark that gives birth to the world to come. And that's my talk. Thank you.